So, uh, I guess we could start. Can we go ahead and start? Okay. Uh, so, welcome everybody. My name is John Dunn, uh, and I'll be introducing our speaker for today. Uh, Lalita de Peron sends her regrets. She couldn't be here today. Uh, uh, it's a real pleasure to introduce to you uh, Professor Yaroslav Komorowski, whom I know as Slava, as do many people. I think I first got to know Slava, I first became aware of Slava, I think, around 1999 or 2000, because he actually applied to come to UW when I was teaching here the first time around to uh, do a PhD here, and I couldn't take any more students, but I was very intrigued because already by that time, I think you'd already done your translations, maybe by that time we're already out, right? Uh, yeah, the first one, like little, little. Yeah. Uh, uh, so Slav is one of these unusual people who actually had a whole kind of academic career in the Tibetan world, uh, in Tibetan uh, institutions of education, spent a lot of time in uh, Dharamsala, in India, where the Dalai Lama lives in exile, I think became a little bit sort of a, of a local figure in Dharamsala during this period, well known, uh, a well known personality in Dharamsala. And then came back, uh, or, or left Aramsala, and uh, uh, didn't, I think, went back to your native Russia for a little while, but then, a while. And then came to the United States to do a, a doctorate, uh, and we couldn't bring him here, but he went in the end to UVA, University of Virginia, <laughs> and after his doctorate then, uh, he eventually landed at the University of uh, Nebraska-Lincoln, where he's now an associate, a tenured professor, an associate professor of religious studies. Uh, he's written number of articles uh, and some really great books. He's got uh, the Visions of Unity, his first book on this very important Tibetan thinker, I think will come up today, Shaka Chokden. Uh, in his bio, it's his, Shaka Chokden is described as controversial. Really? Is it controversial? Uh, it's not controversial. To me, it's not controversial <laughs> yeah, exactly. anymore, but, but actually, really interesting thinker, very unusual thinker. And then also a great book that I wish I had written, but Slava did it for me, on Tibetan Buddhism and mystical experience. Uh, and now he's got, I think, this present uh, paper that he's going to uh, present today on ultimate plus virtue equals ultimate virtue, uh, maybe question mark, uh, is uh, going to is uh, based on your forthcoming book, right? The new uh, book? Or the one you're working just on? in the process. In the process, okay. In any case, it's a real pleasure to see Slava again. Uh, this isn't the first time he's been to Madison. He actually taught here for a year, I think it was, uh, some years ago. So very happy to welcome back. Really looking forward to hearing your talk, Slava. Thank you. Thank you. So I think what I'm going to do, because it's, it's pretty dense, the topic is very sort of dense, and I have only 40 minutes to um, talk, right? So what I'll do, I'll just read my paper, and hopefully we'll have enough time to, uh, you know, to have questions and answers. And uh, I presume that most of you are familiar with some of the basic uh, Buddhist ideas, such as ultimate reality and virtue and non-virtue and things like that, right? So I'll just read it and hopefully you won't fall asleep and uh, can follow me, okay? So, <clears throat> the paper is called Ultimate plus Virtue equals Ultimate Virtue, question mark. Tibetan thinkers debate the possibility of virtuous ultimate reality. A prominent feature shared by Indian and Tibetan Buddhist approaches to the human nature is their unwillingness uh, to treat it as evil or non-virtuous. Indian and Tibetan thinkers are in agreement that on the most fundamental or ultimate level, our nature is always pure, while afflictions and other obscurations are only adventitious. Nevertheless, what exactly that ultimate nature is, whether it is virtuous or neutral, and what the relationship between it and virtue is, are the subjects of continuous debate. Focusing on these issues, I will address conflicting positions of Tibetan thinkers on the question whether our ultimate nature is a virtue, appraising how different understandings of the ultimate nature affect their perspectives on what can or cannot be treated as virtue. Tibetan thinkers generally adapt one of the two contradictory models of the ultimate nature of living beings. According to one model, it's neutral and or transcends all notions of virtue and evil. Consequently, it is argued, although we have a potential to develop positive qualities and virtues, we are not good or virtuous at the very core, as far as our ultimate nature is concerned. According to another model, our ultimate nature has positive, <laughs> virtuous qualities, even though it transcends 
dualistic concepts of goodness and badness. Consequently, it is argued that it's good and virtuous or are virtue. While both positions are articulated in Indian texts uh, taken by Tibetans as uh, authoritative, Tibetan scholars usually treat only one of the two as, as definitive, issuing dramatically different interpretations of such categories as ultimate virtue, or virtue in terms of the ultimate, found among other sources in Asanga's summary of higher knowledge, or the Dharma Samadhi Overall, when debating the question of ultimate virtue, Tibetan thinkers are occupied not so much with the nature of virtue or goodness per se, as with what the nature of ultimate reality is and how it is related to such categories of virtue or the innate potential for awakening or enlightenment. Their positions on the nature of ultimate reality vary significantly, and they hold highly diverse opinions on the relationship between reality and virtue. To better understand where this diversity is stemming from and thereby provide background for the discussion of conflicting positions on ultimate virtue, I will begin with some general observations. Buddhist vocabulary contains many terms whose meaning and application vary significantly depending on context, tradition, and thinker. Buddhist commentarial literature lists and elaborates upon multi-layered meanings of such terms. A well-known example is Dharma, which, according to Vasubandhu's principles of explanation, has at least ten meanings, such as knowables, nirvana, mental object, and so forth. While some of these meanings can be included into the broader categories, um, others are usually contradictory. This context-dependent variety is usually not seen by Buddhist thinkers as problematic. After all, what is surprising in one and the same term having different reference? When we turn to the Tibetan and Sanskrit terms translated as virtue, goodness, and here I'm in particular talking about Geva in Tibetan and Kushala in Sanskrit, because again, Geva can translate other um, Sanskrit terms. At first glance, the situation appears to be the same. <clears throat> Indian and Tibetan thinkers can provide lists of phenomena subsumed under this category, explain why each of them is termed virtue, and not trace question about why or uh, which of these phenomena are real virtues and which are only imputed as such. Depending on context, those thinkers might use this term narrowly, for example, when identifying a specific mental state as a virtue, or broadly, when calling the whole Buddhist teachings virtue at the beginning, middle, and end. They can apply the term to the Buddhist practice with its results, the context of text they compose, and much more. A good example of this broad and inclusive treatment is Asanga's summary of higher knowledge that I just mentioned. The text addresses 13 types of virtues, such as virtues in terms of entity, um, then virtues in terms of connection, and most importantly for our discussion, virtue in terms of the ultimate. Um, addressing this virtue, Asanga uh, virtues, Asanga doesn't raise the question of which of them are real and which are not. On the surface, the use, usage of kushala in the broader sense here does not appear to be more problematic than the usage of Dharma. Yet, the, uh, the question of whether ultimate reality is a virtue, or to put it differently, whether it is a real or just an imputed virtue, became an important polemical issue in Tibet. Why so? To start with, let us note that uh, despite the diversity of phenomena subsumed under the category of virtue, all of them share one specific feature in common. Engaging them explicitly or implicitly, directly or indirectly, is believed to bring about positive results. This approach is closely connected with the widely used interpretation of virtues as phenomena which produce happiness as their main result. Happiness in the mind of the person who uh, performed or accumulated them. Um, contributing to this take on virtues as positively functioning phenomena is the fact that um, a context where virtues are given the most exhaustive treatment is that of the discussion of actions or karmas, such as the ten virtues and ten non-virtues karmas. Um, in that context, uh, characteristic features of the narrow category of virtues karmas can be seen to apply to the broader category of virtues in general. The following passage from Saki Pandita Kunga Gansen, uh, whose views on the ultimate virtue will be addressed below, I'll talk a lot about him, or a little bit about him, uh, can be read as intending just that, to quote. 
The Buddha taught in sutras uh, that among karmas, there are virtues, evil and non-specified ones, so neutral ones. Virtue is what is well created, producing happiness at its fruition, end quote. This functioning quality of virtues partly explains why, when focusing on the analysis of virtues, Tibetan Buddhist thinkers seldom address phenomena that do not have this quality. Because ultimate reality is often seen as one such phenomenon, in the context of uh, discussing virtues, it is usually addressed merely as a static, quote-unquote, quote, object of wisdom or insight, with no deeper connection, how much less overlap, between the categories virtues and ultimate reality. From such perspective, ultimate reality can at best be an imputed virtue, while treating it as a real virtue entails many unwelcome um, consequences. As a result, many Tibetan thinkers would object to treating as an actual virtue, the virtue in terms of the ultimate on Asanga's list that I mentioned. Yet even Asanga's summary of higher knowledge, which puts ultimate reality into the category of uncompounded, uncompounded phenomena, provides a room for alternative interpretations. The texts identify the suchness, or dhatha, or as emptiness, and dharmadhatu, or sphere of reality. And unpacking the meaning of the latter term, dharmadhatu, explains that dharmadhatu is called so because of being the cause, cause of dharmas connected with the three types of awakening. Um, <clears throat> so, of shravakas, prateka, buddhas, and buddhas. Asanga's treatment of dharmadhatu is the cause of dharmas connected with uh, the three types of awakening. Maybe, and as we'll see, has been taken literally. While this approach may raise the objection that such an uncompounded phenomenon as dharmadhatu will turn out to be impermanent, it does allow one um, it, uh, to treat the ultimate as an actual virtue capable of producing positive results. The possibility of such a take on the ultimate um, can in part explain why, although the static quote-unquote virtue of ultimate reality and its exclusion from the category of actual virtue is quite widespread in Tibet, it is not the only one. As we'll see below, such thinkers, uh, some thinkers do treat their particular version of ultimate reality as an actual virtue, raising in the process important philosophical, ethical, and practical questions. Uh, when exploring Tibetan polemics on the ultimate virtue, uh, we should also take into account objectives or styles of Indian texts resorted to or relied on in um, those polemics. Greatly simplifying and keeping in mind significant overlaps between them, we can put out, uh, point out three types of texts. Uh, I call them classificatory, deconstructive, and positively articulating innate awakening. So the first one is, uh, examples of the first are the Abhidharma texts, such as Asanga Summary of Higher Knowledge. Um, those texts are concerned with defining and classifying phenomena into different categories and matching those categories with each other as the means of organizing and coherently presenting diverse sets of Buddhist teachings. It is little wonder that those texts include even such phenomena as ultimate reality into different lists of categories and match them. Examples of the second are the Matyamaka writings, such as Nagarjuna's Wisdom, the Root Stanzas on Matyamaka. Those writings are in big part uh, concerned with deconstructing conceptual proliferations and present reality and realization of reality achieved through that deconstruction as completely transcending them all, including the category of virtue. And such writings are usually linked with the second Dharma Chakra, the second turning of the will. Um, by the Buddha, such as Prajna Paramita Sutras, right? And the examples of the third are the texts on Tathagata Garva, or the Buddha nature, right? Such as Matyamaka's sublime continuum of Mahayana, uh, Maitreya's sublime continuum of Mahayana. That literature, which is usually linked with the third Dharma Chakra, the third turning of the will, uh, concerns with demonstrating some sort of ultimate reality within sentient beings which goes beyond such categories as emptiness and selflessness, and that is not different from that of a Buddha. This reality, similar to the awakened mind of a Buddha, might be treated as virtuous, or when the transcendent dimension of Buddhahood is emphasized, as transcending virtues. Seminal Tibetan thinkers of the third half of the second millennium, including the ones whose writings I will address below, 
are engaged in the common work of organizing and systematizing heterogeneous Buddhist works they inherited from India, such as the ones just mentioned. Depending on their individual perspectives, uh, preferences, and traditions they belong to, those thinkers classified and interpreted those works very differently. As we'll see below, some would give preference to the views stemming from the third Dharma Chakra, others the second. Some would base their views on the works of Madhyamaka thinkers, such as Nagarjuna, um, with his followers. Others on the works of Yogacharas, such as Asanga. Those preferences affected their specific perspectives on the ultimate virtue, further contributing to the Tibetan polemics on the issue. Now, let me now turn to the positions of three Tibetan thinkers on the ultimate virtue. I'll start with the position of Rapo Shirab Jumne. His dates are 1187 to 1241. A chief disciple of the seminal Jigung Kagyu thinker, Jigung Kyopu Jigtengurbo, which is presented as a record of his master's teachings. I'll then outline the refutation of the key elements of that position by the towering figure of the Sakya tradition, Saki Pandeta Kyungak Galsen. His dates are 1182 to 1251. And after that, I will address the critical approach to Sakya Pandita's stance and ultimate virtue in general, developed by the controversial Sakya thinker, controversial or just Sakya thinker, right? Sir Dokpichen Shagashu Dead. His dates are 1428 to 1507. So, starting with the position of Raboshi uh, Rabjune. So, I'll focus here on his text, which is known as uh, Writings on the Holy Dharma of single intent, Gunchik Yikcha in Tibetan. The text is presented as a record, he is a quite controversial, by the way, <laughs> not as his own, own tradition, but uh, the text is presented as a record of Jigteng Gyumpo's teachings, structured around uh, its main part, which is known as the single intent, Gunchik, uh, supplemented with further commentaries and additional uh, materials. Although there is no reason to doubt that these teachings, teachings derive from Jigteng Gyumpo himself, I present them as uh, Shirab Jonas' own position because it is difficult to clearly distinguish between the exact words of Jigten Gurupo on the one hand and their paraphrasing, interpretations, and additions by Shirab Jonas <coughs> on the other. The part of the writings of the Holy Dharma of Single Intent, which interests us here, is the one where Shirab Jonas comments on the following little line from the Single Intent, which says, <coughs> it's just one line, virtues existent accumulated by all in samsara and nirvana are to be dedicated. Right? Virtues existent, accumulated by all in samsara and nirvana are to be dedicated. Unpicking the meaning of the sentence, which he paraphrases as the dedication of all roots of virtues of samsara and nirvana, Sharab Juna first focuses on the accumulated virtues, which he also calls roots, accumulated roots of virtues. Then he proceeds to explain the meaning of the existent virtue, which he also calls the existent root of virtue. With regard to the accumulated roots of virtues, he is points this, out sorry, that... Oh, hmm? Is that Yupe? What is it? Sakpigyava. Sakpigyava or Sakpigyava Tsa. Sakpigyava Tsa. What's the other one? Yupigyava or hmm? Mubugyava? Yeah, the, the other one is Yopigyava. So the existent virtue is Yopigyava, or the existent root of virtue is Yopigyava Tsa. So, with regard to the accumulated roots of virtues, uh, he points out that in this particular passage, Jigteng Gopo proposes to appropriate Daktu Sung, or own, all roots of virtues in all of Samsara and Nirvana, collect them in a single mind mandala, or Senge King Kor in Tibetan, that is mentally put them together, and dedicate them to awakening. <clears throat> so, which is, by the way, nothing special, it's pretty much common um, take on just virtues, <laughs> right? But the other one is more complicated. Regarding the existent truth of virtue, Shirab Jhone writes that it is the naturally pure element, element, come, uh, which is none other than Tathagata Gapa for him. It's the same thing for him. He further argues in favor of dedicating it. He accepts three characteristics of Tathagata Garba, or the Buddha nature. Uh, it is permanent, Takpa in Tibetan, virtues of Gela and unchangeable, Migyuva. So make, he makes clear that he understands the permanence of Tathagata Garba, not in terms of its lack of change, in which case he would not need to discuss his known changeability separately, but in terms of its never-ending continuity. It persists forever. Right? When discussing Tathagata Garba as a virtue, he provides citations from multiple texts 
such as uh, one a part of Avatanska Sutra, uh, known as the tenth Vajras Vaj dedication, and also the lion's roar of Shemala Devi uh, Sutra, which he reads as supporting not only his claim that Tathagata Gargu is a virtue, but also that it is suitable to dedication, suitable for dedication. He also writes that according to the letter text, Tathagata Gargu is a virtue because of being both the fact of wisdom in terms of its lack of afflictions and the fact of method in terms of its extensive positive qualities, which clearly indicates that for Sirajuna, Tathagata Garba, which he treats as the same as Dharma Data, is a virtue not just in terms of providing a support for virtues to function or positive results to happen or ripen, but in terms of itself being a combination, so to say, of two factors, uh, non-afflicted wisdom and positive qualities. Turning to the unchangeability of Tathagata Garba or Dharma Datu, he argues that it does not undergo changes. Nevertheless, on the conventional level, until the stains of mistaken appearances have been purified, Dharma Datu can be posited in terms of cause and result. Yet, even on that level, it should be posited not in terms of productive causes and their results, but in terms of the change of states. First, on the causal level of uh, living beings, it is not purified of stains, and later on the resultant level of Buddhahood, um, it is um, free of them. Although in terms of this change of state, it might appear as undergoing changes, in fact it does no one. Sharab Junesh thereby makes clear that he does not treat, doesn't view Dharma Datu as impermanent, right? Just appears to be impermanent, appears to change, but it does not undergo change. Consequently, for him, it is not a virtue in terms of a functional phenomenon uh, producing positive result, as I mentioned before. So having discussed Dharma Datu's three features of permanence, virtues, and uh, virtue and changelessness, Sharab Juna returns to the twofold division of virtues into accumulated and existent. So here he argues that the dedication of both types of virtues uh, to the unsurpassed awakening was taught in the sutras of the third Dharma Chakra, such as, again, this text of the tenth Vajra dedication. Uh, and here he quotes it. Uh, for example, a couple of lines here. As many virtues of my creator says they exist, created, to be created, and likewise being created, so let everything come in contact with good, end quote. So he writes that consequently, uh, with Tathagata Garba being inconceivable and immeasurable, the accumulated virtues will also become inconceivable and immeasurable when blessed by it through dedication. So blessed by that existent virtue. He argues that this position is articulated in the Tathagata Garba Sutras, which teach that if virtues are dedicated to awakening, they become inconceivable, and that there are limited benefits of dedication to awakening by the blessings and power of the virtuous element, that is, Tathagata Garba. He writes that, therefore, it is crucial to dedicate to the unsurpassed awakening all our virtues, accumulated and existent, in three times. Thus, Sharab Junay not only accepts the effectiveness of dedicating the ultimate virtue in its own right, but also believes that such dedication increases the effectiveness or power of other dedicated virtues. As Sharab Junay's sources and the way he interprets them demonstrate, his position is primarily informed by ideas related to the last or third Dharma Chakra. Uh, he does appeal to such um, second Dharma Chakra texts as the Extensive Perfection of Wisdom Sutra, for example, as well as Nagarjuna's works, but his main emphasis is clearly on the third. Another feature of his approach is that from among two main argumentative tools used by Tibetan thinkers, such as textual statements and reasoning, he primarily relies on the former, without much interest in purely logical arguments. Both of these elements of Sharab Junes' approach make it vulnerable to criticisms and polemical attacks, especially by those thinkers who put more emphasis on logical reasoning and whose views are grounded primarily in the second Dharma Chakra. Although, as we will see, they too appeal to the last Dharma Chakra text. It is one such thinker, Sakya Pandita, uh, Pandita, to whom we will turn next. So now we are moving to the second uh, thinker. So here I will focus on Sakya Pandita's uh, text, which is known as Thorough Differentiation of the Three Types of Vows, one of the earliest Tibetan polemical treatises. Um, the Thorough Differentiation criticizes those thinkers who uphold the possibility of dedicating ultimate virtue, interpret the 10th Vajra Vajra's passage 
that I referred to be, uh, before as referring to the self-reason, existent virtue, and treat that virtue as that Hagatagara, or the Buddha nature. Although Saki Pandita does not specify who those Tibetan thinkers are, it is clear that his polemics directly target Sharab Jones' position outlined above. In his elaborate refutation of that position, and I will not go into details of that here, uh, Saki Pandita focuses on three interrelated claims that there is a primordially existent virtue, that Tathagata Garba is a virtue, and that Tathagata Garba can be dedicated. Uh, all of which, as we have just seen, um, are accepted by Sharab Junais Velik. While Saki Pandita doesn't refute the claim of the unchangeability of Dharmadatta, because uh, he accepts it, uh, he does show its incompatibility with the claim that Dharmadatta can be dedicated. He starts his refutation by asserting that Dharmadhatu, or Tathagata Garva, is the unchangeable Dharmadhatu, a position that Sharab Jhune would happily agree with. But the conclusion he draws is in direct contradiction with that of Sharab Jhune. Equating Dharmadhatu with the ultimate reality as it is told in the perfection of wisdom literature and Nagarjuna's text, he uses those scriptures, scriptural sources, in order to demonstrate that Tathagata Garba or Dharmadhatu cannot be dedicated because it is changeless and transcends virtue and evil. Of course, Saki Pandita is well aware that many sutras and Indian commentarial works appear, appear to teach that Dharmadhatu is a virtue by either listing it among many categories that include the word virtue or explicitly describing it as a virtue. Nevertheless, he persistently treats such passages as referring to either virtues or the ultimate, and never to say something which is both a virtue and the ultimate. As for the ultimate virtue taught in the summary of higher knowledge, as, as understood, uh, Saki Pandita states unequivocally that precisely because it refers to suchness or ultimate reality, it cannot be an actual virtue. But if suchness or dharmadhatu is not an actual virtue, then uh, what is the reason for calling it virtue in first place? According to Saki Pandita, um, it is called virtue simply in terms of the absence of evil, not because of involving any additional virtuous qualities besides uh, that. This is similar, he says, to the reason for calling the freedom from illness physical happiness and the absence of sorrow mental happiness, although they, uh, neither one involves um, any additional elements other than the lack of sorrow. Uh, that very lack of suffering is called happiness. This line of argument makes, uh, makes clear that, according to Sakya Pandita, unless something acts as a productive cause of happiness, and therefore is impermanent, compounded, and falling outside the scope of ultimate reality, it cannot be an actual virtue, only an imputed one. The same logic applies to Dharmadhatu in particular, as he puts it, to quote, Although Dharmadhatu also was thought to be, or was said to be a virtue, it is not an actual virtue which produces the result of happiness." End quote. This shows that he limits the interpretation of virtue to a functional phenomenon producing happiness, as he puts it in another verse to quote. Because these are created karmas, they should be known as compounded. Because Dharmadhatu is uncompounded, it is not a karma, therefore it is neither a virtue nor evil. An evil. End quote. <clears throat> When he turns to the uh, Vajad Vajad dedication passage, starting with as many virtues of my greatest as they exist, Saki Pandita argues that it refers not to the innate primordially existent virtue, but simply to virtues created by all living beings. He points out that if this passage were referring to Dharma Dato, neither the words as many nor the word exist would be applicable. This is because, he says, as many indicates multiplicity, while Dharmadhatu being free from proliferations is beyond multiplicity and scarcity. Not only that, Dharmadhatu transcends the category of existence itself, according to him. As he puts it, Dharmakirti is not, uh, Dharmadhatu is not even existent. Dharmakirti taught well that just existent is necessarily imperfect. End quote. So this characteristic of, uh, characteristic of existence in uh, Saki Pandita's opinion does not apply to of impermanence, sorry, <clears throat> doesn't apply to Dharmadatta. So for him, whatever exists has to be impermanent. Right? 
So Saki Pandita further argues that existence is a phenomenon able to function. Well, Dharmadhatu, being free from proliferation, is beyond acting or functioning. An additional reason why Saki Pandita objects to the dedication of Dharmadhatu is that, in his opinion, it will render it a functional thing because dedication would have to transform it. Otherwise, he argues, dedication that does not involve transformation or change is meaningless. But accepting that Dharmadhatu can undergo transformation or change would contradict the Buddha's teaching that Dharmadhatu is unchangeable, according to him. In other words, he points out the following contradiction. Were it possible to dedicate Dharmadhatu, it would be liable to change and therefore not the actual Dharmadhatu. Um, were, uh, and were it not liable to ch uh, change through dedication, that dedication would not act as a transformative force and thus would not be an actual dedication. Saki Pandita also objects to the claim that although Dharmadhatu is not a virtue liable to dedication, one can benefit from using its dedication as a form of the Bodhisattva's mind training. Objecting to this position too, he writes that such dedication is faulty, mistaken, because it involves discrimination of objects of observation and thereby spoils all uh, other dedications. The reason is that the actual Bodhisattva's mind training consists of dedicating all virtues, whether accomplished or not yet accomplished, from within the state of Dharmadhatu free from proliferations. If one treats Dharmadhatu free from proliferations as a virtue, it will render it an object of observation. But, he argues, it was thought that if dedication involved uh, discrimination that has objects of observation, uh, such dedication is poisonous, similar to eating food uh, good food mixed with poison. Overall, Saki Pandita's position, which is supported not only by textual references, but also multiple logical uh, arguments, looks much stronger than that of Sharab Juna, who primarily appeals to scriptural authority. Nevertheless, on the surface at least, it is one-sided, in the sense of siding with only one interpretation of ultimate virtue, and rejecting others as invalid or at best having an interpretive meaning. This position, uh, based mainly on the teachings of the second Dharma Chakra and related commentarial literature, can and has been understood as a straightforward endorsement of the idea of Dharma Dato as freedom from proliferations, which is beyond virtue, non-virtue, and even existence as such. That said, later Tibetan thinkers did feel the need to critically approach, further elaborate on, and to interpret this position. One of those thinkers was Shakyachukda, to whose position we turn now. So this is the last one we'll talk about, the third thinker here. Shakyachukda then raised questions regarding Saki Pandita's position uh, on ultimate virtue in his um, text, which is called Good Questions, about the thorough differentiation of the three types of vows. The text, uh, which was composed in 1475, poses more than 100 critical questions about Saki Pandita's thorough differentiation. Not about, just about virtue, there's lots of other, uh, many, many questions there. Um, it provoked a considerable controversy among Sakya scholars, and a few of them attempted to provide answers. In uh, 1481, six years after um, writing the first text, Shakichuk then answered his own questions in the text which is known as the Golden Lancet. Um, so that's what we'll be using here. Primarily, so what I'm saying below is primarily based on what he said in that text. <clears throat> it's, there are about maybe 15 questions and answers dealing with the issue of ultimate reality versus virtue and so forth. So Saki, uh, Saki then acknowledges uh, that Saki Pandita's thorough differentiation explicitly says that ultimate reality cannot be an actual virtue. But he argues against taking this statement literally. Instead, he takes literally such sources as Asanga's commentary on the sublime continuum, which describes Tathagata Garba as virtue and purity, um, as well as his summary of Mahayana, which describes the thoroughly established, which is just another name for ultimate reality here, as follows, to quote Asanga. Why is it called thoroughly established? It is, it is thoroughly established because of not changing into another because of being a pure object of observation and the supreme of all virtuous dharmas. Supreme of all virtuous dharmas. Uh, due to having that supreme meaning, it is thoroughly established." End quote. 
In contrast to Sakya Pandita, Shakyachuk then does not think that such statements should be interpreted as referring to the thoroughly established, etc., as a virtue simply in terms of the mere absence of evil. Yet, instead of openly uh, saying that he disagrees with Sakya Pandita's position, he proceeds to reinterpret it as to fit his own position on ultimate reality as a virtue. Shakyachuk then explains that there are two dissimilar modes of identifying Dharmadhatu, which derive from the systems of other emptiness and self-emptiness. According to the former system, Dharmadhatu is the primordial mind, or jnana, free from the duality of the subject and object, apprehended and apprehended. According to the latter, which is, uh, what is called Dharmadhatu, is uh, no, just non-affirmative negation, uh, in terms of the mere negation of the entire mass of conceptual proliferation. Followers of the former system treat Dharmadhatu as a knowing, or mind, a functional thing, and most significantly, in this context, a virtue. Followers of the latter system do not treat Dharmadhatu as a virtue, arguing that being an extreme of uh, proliferations, be it virtue, non-virtue, or anything else, contradicts being Dharmadhatu. Now, according to Sekhetruk then, when Sekhet Pandita said that such texts as the summary of higher knowledge uh, called ultimate reality virtue in terms of the mere absence of evil, he himself accepted the self-emptiness approach, not the approach of those texts, and his interpretation should not be understood as a denial of the other emptiness position outlined there. In other words, Shakyachuk then openly disagrees with the literal reading of Sakya Pandita's text, but instead of saying that Sakya Pandita was wrong, claims that Sakya Pandita himself provisionally adopted a special point of view, and therefore his interpretation itself has to be interpreted. This approach allows Shakyachuk then to advance his own position, which on the surface level is very different from that of Sakya Pandita, but in Shakyachuk then's opinion is implicitly endorsed by him. So, that position is, ultimate reality is the non-dual jnana uh, and a virtue. In other words, according to Sakyachuk then, ultimate virtue equals ultimate reality, dharmadhatu, which is the non-dual jnana itself. So, Sakyachuk then argues that in this context, dharma should be interpreted as arya dharmas, and dhatu as a cause. So, this causal interpretation of dharmadhatu is related to the contemplative process engaged in by Mahayana Aryas, right? So, nobles who realize the ultimate reality. So, observing Dharmadhatu in their mental continuum uh, and habituating with it in accordance with their modes of realization, they let their respective positive qualities be born from within Dharmadhatu. <clears throat> Literally, born from Dharmadhatu. This process is similar, he said, to seeds in a field producing sprouts from themselves when nourished by water and so forth. He clearly treats Dharmadhatu as a productive cause and therefore a functioning thing. He also treats it as a predisposition capable of producing results. Within the two types of predispositions, stained and stainless, it is of course the latter. Um, Shagatuk then also describes those stainless predispositions as stainless seeds and stainless knowing or mind. And um, um, note that as, as this approach demonstrates, Shagatuk then sees the ultimate reality and potentials of predispositions as overlapping. Uh, which is possible because of his interpretation of Dharmadhatu as a causally effective phenomenon. He further explains that there are two types of stainless seeds, the ones obtained by nature, or like naturally existent, and um, the other which are appropriated anew, newly accomplished, created. Within the two types of lineage, when we talk about two Buddha lineages, right, or Rik in Tibetan, Gotra in Sanskrit, the latter are the developmental lineage, the former are the naturally abiding lineage, and therefore they are uncompounded in terms of not being produced anew. Nevertheless, it doesn't mean that they do not undergo momentary disintegration. They are impermanent for him. Yet that fact that they disintegrate does not contradict them being posited as permanent, because that is done in terms of their never-ending continuity. So their continuity is permanent, but it doesn't um, run contrary to the fact that they change moment by moment. Furthermore, those stainless seeds are virtues, because when meeting with nourishing conditions, their entity turns into powers of the Buddha and other virtues. Without doubt, the most striking feature of 
Second Chubindan's interpretation of ultimate reality is the claim that it is impermanent. Nevertheless, he agrees, uh, he argues that its impermanence does not contradict it, in, it being explained as permanent in the system of other objects. This is because, he says, there is no contradiction between being posited as permanent in terms of the permanence of continuity and being explained as impermanent in terms of the momentary impermanence. In other words, he argues that according to the other emptiness system, Dharma Dato is momentary and changes moment by moment, but it is also described as permanent because its continuity never ceases. As we can see, Shaky Chukdan presents the ultimate reality, the non-dual jnana, Dharma Dato, as a virtue in at least two respects. It is the cause of, all, the cause of positive dharmas in general, and the cause of the Arya dharmas in particular. So what can be a better virtue than that? That said, he explains that Dharmadhatu is not a dedicatable virtue. This is because even without uh, Dharmadhatu of sentient beings being dedicated, it abides from the very beginning as the Buddha lineage and because, and because its entity does not change into something else. So it doesn't transform into something else. This is like, for example, when the clouded sky clears up, the sky itself does not undergo change. See? So it undergoes change in terms of that momentary change, but it doesn't change into another phenomenon. And hence it cannot be dedicated according to Shakyachuk Den. So Shakyachuk Den's interpretive stance can be characterized as an attempt to strike a balance between two rival approaches to the question whether ultimate reality can be characterized as a virtue. One in term by the informed by the, by the other emptiness perspective and the other by the self-emptiness perspective without at the same time openly criticizing Sakya Pandita's position. Treating ultimate reality as functioning cause of Arya Dharmas, or just uh, positive, uh, virtues in general, positive Dharmas, uh, is Sakya Chukden's way of resolving the problem of the ultimate being described, sometimes in one and the same text and passage, as we just saw uh, in uh, Sangha texts, right? <clears throat> Such as the one from the summary of Mahayana. Uh, as permanent or changeless on the one hand and a virtue on the other. It is also uh, this feature that makes his position so radically different from Sakya Pandita's explicit position, articulated in the thorough differentiation of the three types of vows. This position presents a very provocative and uh, heuristic, I would say, approach to the ultimate reality, applying the, widesp the widesp widespread understanding of virtue as a phenomenon producing positive results to the unchanging and transcendent ultimate reality. It provides in the process intriguing, intriguing perspectives on such seminal issues as the nature of mind, potential for awakening, and much more. Now, to conclude, the three positions outlined above demonstrate that the question of whether ultimate reality can be characterized as a virtue goes beyond the issue of treating ultimate reality as a real versus an imputed virtue. Tapping into the intersection of ethics and ontology, the three thinkers not only provide different perspectives on the broader question of relationship between ultimate reality and virtue, but also approach differently the practical outcomes of their respective interpretations of those two categories. As we have seen, uh, Sharab Junet not only treats Dharma Dato as an actual virtue, but also insists that its dedication is beneficial and enhances the dedication of other virtues as well. Uh, Saki Pandita argues for exactly the opposite, because Dharmadhatu transcends all conceptual objects, including virtues. His dedication as a virtue conflicts with the proper understanding of ultimate reality and therefore is counterproductive. Not only that, it contradicts that very factor which enhances proper dedication engaging in it from within the understanding of reality described as the state of non-observation. While Shakyachuk then agrees that Dharma Dato is not a virtue that can be dedicated, he does insist that it is a natural virtue, which is a functional phenomenon producing positive results. Not only is it an object, so to say, of a virtuous mind directly perceiving ultimate reality, but it is that very mind itself and serves as the cause of Arya Dharma and other virtues that are born from within it. These are just some practical implications of different perspectives on ultimate virtue. There are more, 
whether stated explicitly or not by the three thinkers, which I am currently exploring while writing that book. Um, um, I hope as a result of further research to discover deeper connections between philosophical, ethical, and practical dimensions of different views on ultimate virtue. If there is any virtue to that study, I will want to dedicate it to all those who explicitly or implicitly help bring this research to conclusion. Thank you. Would you follow me? <laughs>